Coming up on Two and a Half Geeks, Sandy Bridge gets extreme. We talk about some more games, and then there's going to be some fun about a contest. You guys are going to love it. Coming up right now. The bar has been set wicked fast. It rocked in the benchmarks. We're going to up the ante uh, a little bit. Processing power. Maybe. I kind of understand this. Welcome back to Two and a Half Geeks. I'm Aya Zaktar. I haven't seen you guys in a while. I'm, I'm with two strangers known as uh, Dave Altavilla and Marco Cipetta. How are you guys doing? Doing good. I'm doing not a stranger, great. though. I don't know. Stranger danger? How about Marco? How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm doing really good. You're doing good. great? Can't complain. That, that's always You can't complain. I, I like that. That's a good positive attitude. Let's, uh, go. let's get right to it. You know, I haven't talked about hardware in a really long time, but I am aware of Intel's last step before we finally get to Ivy Bridge. The Intel Core i7 3960X Stream Edition. Wow, this yes. is fun to say. Uh, now, Marco, <laughs> could you first explain what makes this the last step to Ivy Bridge, I guess, and uh, tell us a little bit about the processor. Sure. So uh, this latest chip is based on the Sandy Bridge E or Sandy Bridge Extreme microarchitecture. Now, if you take everything that made Sandy Bridge great and just made it more extreme, you have Sandy Bridge Extreme. So instead of uh, quad cores on the die, there's actually eight cores on the Sandy Bridge E die, even, even though only six are enabled. Um, there's uh, 20 megs of cache on the die, even though only 15 megs are enabled on the current high-end chip. Uh, there's 40 lanes of PCI Express connectivity. And although Intel's not saying it's PCI Express 3.0, it's capable of those speeds. Um, once it's fully qualified, they'll probably brand it uh, PCIe 3.0 as long as everything passes, which is expected to do. Uh, you have Turbo Core 2.0, a totally new socket, totally new motherboard chipset to support it. It is just new all around, and it's not by far, but it is the fastest platform we've tested yet. Now, I, I was very curious about the fact that there are two inactive cores on that thing, and they're saying power consumption, and that's part of the issue. Is there any right. way that uh, Intel could figure out, I don't know, some kind of upgrade to the actual processor down the line, or some kind of, I don't know if, if this is even an applicable thing, but like a firmware upgrade or something to make those things active, or is it those two, are those two cores never going to be usable? So on the current chips that are out right now, they'll probably never be, be usable. Um, it, only because the, this this current spin of the chip, it, it does consume it, it consumes less power than Gulf Town, but it consumes more than Intel would have liked. So to stick into the 130 watt TDP that's been traditional across their high end chips, they had to fuse off these two cores. Um, the base clock speed is 3.3 gigahertz, which is actually lower than the the top of the line Gulf Town. The 990X has a 3.46 clock speed. Um, the Sandy Bridge E does turbo up to 3.9, so it, it is still faster in single core stuff um, because of that. But I don't think you'll see those cores become active in this version of the chip. I'm fairly certain a, a, a respin will hit the desktop where all eight cores are active. You are going to see eight core Xeons, which are based on the same die. So Intel does have the processors and will have more moving forward. So I couldn't get them to comment definitively and say, yes, an 8-core uh, Core i7 Extreme is coming. But it just makes sense that it will. Um, the current 6-core, it was faster than their high end. Why not launch it? Make some money off this spin. And when new ones come, they can uh, do another launch and carry them all the way to Ivy Bridge. Is there, is there any re real reason to upgrade if you have a Sandy Bridge uh, processor now to the Extreme when Ivy Bridge is just around the corner? <sighs> Tough question. Um, the current platform, the X79 platform and, and the Socket 2011 is going to support Ivy Bridge. So if you want to get, on, get in on the action now and eBay your CPU later to get an Ivy Bridge CPU, um, all indicators are that you know, an enthusiast board that, with a manufacturer that thought of Ivy Bridge, it's going to work. With that said, the X79 chipset, this current version, it, it also has some features fused off. Um, that just just due to yield, it's supposed to have um, more SATA ports, SAS, um, and Intel couldn't get that all working at times, so they just fused it off. So even though these current motherboards will probably support Ivy Bridge, by the time Ivy Bridge comes, I would think there's going to be a newer version of the chipset with all these features as well, and people may want that. Now, in terms of just strictly performance, 
having that quad channel memory on Sandy Bridge E equates to almost 40 gigs a second of bandwidth. You also have tons of compute with those six cores, 12 threads, you know, boosting up to, you know, 3.9 gigahertz in some scenarios. So in terms of performance, you know, it's an upgrade over everything. It's the fastest thing out there. Um, it's clearly faster than the 2700K in anything multi-threaded that's going to leverage the CPU. On single or dual threaded stuff, a current Sandy Bridge uh, 2700K is going to be just as fast. They're the same two cores. They hit similar clocks. So it really is going to depend on your use case and what kind of apps that you're running. Um, but if, if you want the top of the line, this is clearly it. Um, it's going to cost you. It's a thousand bucks, almost a thousand bucks for the chip, two to three hundred bucks for motherboards. But you know, it may carry you all the way to Ivory Bridge, and you can just pop in a new CPU if you want to stick with your board. Let's change. There's a lower speed bin coming too, right? Though that's in the six hundred dollar range. Yeah, right? there's a lower speed bin six core, lower speed bin six core coming, and a quad core uh, coming in Q1. Let's change, let's change gears and talk a, a bit about uh, some games. You know, because, I mean, if you're going to have some fancy hardware, you should be playing some games on them eventually. Call of Duty <laughs> Modern Warfare 3 dropped, and uh, you guys reviewed it. You checked it out. And, of course, it's going to have comparisons right off the bat to Battlefield 3, which, which dropped weeks earlier. Uh, Dave, what was uh, Hot Hardware's impression of Modern War Warfare 3? Well, you know, it's interesting. Joel uh, took this... Uh, assignment for us and uh, you know we really expected to be wowed a lot more from from Modern Warfare 3 and it turns out that you know the single player uh, aspect of the game and the multiplayer aspect of the game definitely you know lived up to expectations in terms of the the, the play experience um, you know the the whole um, Modern Warfare or Call of Duty I should say uh, lineage just it's more of the same it's just more really good uh, you know techniques and battle scenarios and and, and different uh, sorts of um, just really good gameplay uh, architect into the game but we were we were left wanting for more and one of the the big critiques we have obviously as PC gamers is that the game engine hasn't been revamped in I don't know how many years and you're basically looking at the same game engine um, we would have liked, you know, some some other, um, you know, different sorts of, of, of nuances that kind of go along with that. You know, different sorts of physics effects and, and and things like that, where you could interact more with the world than the standard Call of Duty franchise has has given us all these years. They didn't really change anything. They they basically just revamped, uh, you know, Call of Duty, you know, from previous uh, versions and and added a few. Uh, you know, wrinkles in for multiplayer and single player experiences. So, you know, left real flat there. And and where they could have really hit a home run is if they took the approach that the folks at Origin did with Battlefield 3. And now Battlefield 3 is sort of like what, what we feel is the poster child, if you will, for PC gaming and, and how impressive graphics and visuals can be uh, and lighting and all that good stuff that that us pixel snobs on the PC platform have been used to and, and have been enjoying all these years while console gamers sit back and they have to deal with lackluster graphics and, and, and effects. So do you think the reason why um, Call of Duty is so far behind is because they're trying to stick to the console based stuff? I mean, why, why are they not taking advantage of the hardware that's out there now? Well, I think for one thing, you know, clearly they were they were milking the the franchise. Everybody was was just you know waiting on you know you know waiting with bated breath for this this new Modern Warfare three sequel to come out, and you know they knew they were going to make scads of dollars off this thing, and and it was just going to be a hit no matter what. They had to they had to obviously bring out you know a new game and 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 definitely engineered that. Uh, to a certain extent, but they didn't really reach for the gold and and do something innovative and, and different with the engine of the game, with the graphics, with the physics, with with just the whole world in general. Uh, we're given more of the same, and and if you look at Battlefield Three, it's 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 so impressive. And uh, you know, my son's a big console gamer. He's got an Xbox 360, and I play with him a little bit on that occasionally. I'm a big PC gamer, obviously. And I continue to wow him when I show him the versions of the PC games, you know, Battlefield 3 and 
from Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 with all the graphics effects turned up, dialed up high, and the anti-aliasing turned up, and how much better it looks on the PC. And I think it's time that these game developers turn it up a notch and, and try and, um, you know, maybe we need to, a refresh in console hardware, but, um, you know, it, it just makes a case for, for us diehard PC gamers that, um, you know, it, you get real impressive stuff on our platform that you just can't get on a console. Marco, I'm kind of curious about your opinion on this whole console PC debate. What's, what's your opinion? Uh, my opinion is that the old consoles we have now are, are a cancer um, for PC gamers. I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I, I know I, I've had, I heard this just recently that Battlefield 3's uh, launch, the number of sales of that game eclipsed the highest grossing movie in Hollywood already in one week. So there's money to be made on a game developed with the PC in mind as their premier gaming pl platform and scaled back for the consoles, whereas the majority of developers are creating games for the consoles, which have five-year-old hardware in them. You know, the, the Xbox has a chip, I believe it's, you know, one generation ahead of the Radeon 2900 series, and the PlayStation yeah. 3 has a chip that's a G47 class chip. So they're developing for, for that kind of hardware and, you know, adding some bells and whistles for the PC. Sometimes you end up with a great game if the, if the graphics are okay and the storytelling is okay um, and they do a, a good job with graphics as best they can. But otherwise, you just end up with another boring port that doesn't get everybody excited. You get somebody excited and uh, something like Battlefield 3 comes and it's like, wow, this game looks great. Single player is not so so awesome, but multiplayer you can have sixty four player multiplayer going on in these you know insanely detailed worlds just looks awesome and blows away every other platform. Another reason why I think the PC is the premier gaming platform, but that's a whole another discussion. So now I'm kind of curious. I mean, hey. go, go <laughs> No, it's, Marco just touched on something that occurred to me, and 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 I'm thinking to myself. Wow, there's there's opportunity here that the console manufacturers just are taking advantage of. As PC gamers, you know, Marco, you, you know this. Every time we, we see a new graphics card launch, you know, you're looking at a, a new generation of graphics cards. NVIDIA and, and AMD and these guys and, and, and big GPU graphics, they're coming out, you know, multiple times a year with, with new chips, new technology. You're talking two to $500 graphics cards, right? In some cases, the high end is you know five hundred, six hundred dollars when it first comes out. The mid range is two to three hundred dollars when it comes out. Why are the console guys that are that are selling these consoles for two hundred to three you know two to three hundred dollars, uh, you know on the low end to the high end maybe three ninety nine for you know a fully decked out system? Why are we not getting more iterations of consoles that support the old software just like the PC platform does, right? But why aren't we getting better hardware on a more regular basis? It, it's just taking too long for the for the innovation cycle at the hardware level on the console side to um, to compete. You know, and, and you would think they could do that like the graphics guys can uh, with these new graphics cards. It's it's not. I mean, certainly there's a lot more that goes into a console, but I don't know. It, it should be able to be done. And and there you could you wouldn't have to sacrifice your graphics quality uh, if they did that to compete. You know, there's an interesting article up over at Hot Hardware. You guys probably have seen it. I'm sure, I think Marco even wrote about it. It was about the uh, Cor Corsair, I can never say that right, Force uh, GT240. Wow, I'm screwing up today. I'm rusty. Sorry, guys. Let's talk about... <laughs> You're not rusty. Let's talk about an SSD update. This was actually surprising to me, and I, I mean this because I, I never even think about uh, firmware and hard drives. But uh, apparently an update to an SSD can make it way faster. Now, Marco, could you tell me about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I I got that Corsair Force GT 240 in for review, um, started testing it, putting it through its, through its paces, and while I was testing that, uh, the folks at Crucial wrote and said, oh, you know, hey, we have a new firmware update for the M4. Uh, it increases performance 20%, increases compatibility, uh, better reliability, a whole bunch of improvements across the board. So I said, all right, well, let's let's test that again, even though I had already covered it a few months earlier. Um, and then I'll slap them both into this, this article and compare and contrast their performance. So what I find with the Corsair Force GT240, it was the fastest Sandforce drive I've tested. Basically, right on par, a hair faster than the OCZ Vertex 3 Max IOPS I tested, but really within the margin of error on the benchmarks. Now, with the Crucial M4, 
the new firmware update really changed the drive altogether. It was a good drive before, and the uh, the design of the Marvell controller um, has it performing consistently with different data sets, whether it's compressible or not. Um, but reads and writes were way behind the Sandforce drives. Now, with this new firmware, performance again remains consistent, but reads are actually on par with Sandforce, you know, the upper 400 meg per second range. Writes improved slightly, um, but it really it changes the whole performance profile of the drive, and it's for free. You just go download your new firmware and flash your drive. So it, it was a, a really cool test to say, hey, you know, if you bought this drive and you liked it, you're going to like it a whole lot more after this firmware update. Now, this has me actually kind of curious about the idea of maybe coming up with your own custom firmware, something you can do to... What if you bought a little <laughs> junky old SSD? Do you think... Is there... An, is there a, a, not a market for this, but is there a bunch of people out there making their own firmware to see if they can get more juice out of their SSDs, or am I just creating something on the spot? <laughs> um, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of anybody should... doing their own custom firmwares, but you bring up a good point because that should be possible. You have drives like this M4, drives like Intel's uh, first-gen drive, um, older Indolinx drives that all got faster with firmware updates over time. And sometimes those firmware updates weren't offered for older drives. It was only newer models based on the controller. And sometimes there were technical issues for that, but other times it was purely marketing. Let's just make the newer drive nicer, you know? So, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. I guess it would be possible. Um, I don't know what kind of uh, security mechanisms the manufacturers have in place to prevent somebody from mucking with the drives. But I know some people um, were able to flash Intel firmwares on old Kingston drives to enable trim when Intel didn't give the option to Kingston when they were rebranding their drives. So I don't know. That's an interesting discussion there, man. I think Ion is, Ayaz is on to something here. It's, we'll be <laughs> cooking up ROMs before you know it like the guys that uh, – uh, what's the Android place? I'm thinking of. I'm blanking. <laughs> yeah, XDA. Yeah, exactly. XDA. That's what I was trying to think yeah, of. It should definitely happen <laughs> over at the Hot Hardware forums. So if you guys are thinking and want a project, go to the forums. Make it happen. I'd love to see something. <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't think Hot Hardware is actually advocating anything like that, but I'm I'm saying so. Well, we would support that. That's not a problem. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I advocate modding and making things better all the time. <laughs> what an idea! Absolutely. Wow, there, I did, there are so many components you don't. Even, I never even thought about just making an SSD faster with firmware. I mean, that's just, uh, of course, but why not? Let, let's talk you about know, just one last quick one last quick point before we move on. Um, a number of the drive manufacturers have actually said that the controllers and the NAND have gotten to the point that the firmware is the real differentiator right now. So something to think about. You know, the fir uh, custom firmware can can make or break a drive right now you know, in terms of its competition. Boy, we're running Get long. Get cooking out there, you coder freaks. We are running <laughs> long, so I'm just going to say, Dave, tell us about the PC Audio Labs Rockbox MC7XS <laughs> preview. Yeah, baby. So we got this machine in from the good folks at PC Audio Labs. It is actually the grand prize for our Giving Thanks sweepstakes that ends at the end of November. Marco's going to tell you about our next series of contests coming up. Uh, but, yes, I actually took a preview look at this machine. Um, you know, full disclosure, it was obviously sponsored for our contest, so we didn't give it the traditional review, gauntlet, rundown, critique, if you will. But it was interesting to look at what makes up uh, what PC Audio Labs and what the industry in, in, that they serve, the, the music industry, the video production industry, uh, what they call a, a DAW, a, a digital audio workstation, and that's what this thing is. Uh, Core i7, 2600K processor, uh, gigabyte Z68 motherboard, 16 gig of DDR3-1333 <laughs> system memory, and uh, an AMD Radeon HD5450 graphics card, so it's a low-end graphics card. Um, it has a 24X uh, dual-layer burner, uh, CD, DVD burner in there, and an Intel uh, 311 SSD, a 20 gig SSD set up on a 500 gig Seagate 7200 RPM hard drive, a, a Barracuda drive. So the SSD is caching the OS on the 500 gig drive. And then in addition to that, this thing's got storage galore, a one terabyte drive, 7200 RPM, one terabyte drive for audio, and uh, a two terabyte drive for samples, what they put a bunch of samples, um, there's something like you know 30 gig of samples on this thing, and so plunk in a, a FireWire 400 card, a PCI FireWire card with another three ports. It's got FireWire on board as well as USB 3, 
And this thing is set up for content creation and uh, digital uh, video and audio production. Very cool little system. Now, now, what if somebody wanted a system like that? How could they get a system like that? Do they have to pay money? Could, they, could there be possibly a contest uh, involved around <laughs> something like that? Or I don't know. Marco, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Well, yeah, I do. Um, so as Dave mentioned, that's the machine we're giving away in the uh, Hot Hardware Giving Thanks sweepstakes, which is fitting. This uh, Thanksgiving is this week. I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving, uh, by the way. Yes. Um, yes. We're randomly going to select a winner um, from commenters on our site and people who share our stuff all over the web. Uh, specifically, Facebook and Twitter will help. Um, but since we have a full article on that machine, I want to drop a hint about our next contest, which is Hang totally different. Second. but. Oh, go one, ahead. Want to jump in one one little thing about this machine before you do move on, because our next contest is cool too. Well, first of all, make sure you you like the PC Audio Labs Facebook page. These guys are trying to build a community on Facebook. Uh, they're a small company, uh, boutique builder out of California. This machine is so whisper quiet. It's easily the most quiet machine. The most quiet. It almost sounds like an oxymoron. Uh, <laughs> it's the quietest machine I've ever heard, and so or not heard, as the case may be. So. Really cool little box. Now, go ahead, Marco. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> so what I was getting at, though, for our, our next contest, um, we are going to work with NVIDIA and a handful of their partners to give away five uh, fully blown tablets based on uh, Tegra. So we're not going to tell you which ones yet. not going to tell you how to win. We are going to make it really easy. And we are going to give away tablets for an entire week. Really, yeah. really cool stuff. So after this... Uh, PC Labs audio contest and this PC Lab system contest is over. Um, stick around for some real exciting stuff. Wow, you guys are just the best. Giving away just super quiet machines and then a bunch of tablets. That's you guys are very lucky. Good times. Wow. Yeah, and and you know, once we're done with those tablets, we've already lined up our next sponsor, so it's going to be a good year end for us. All right. Wow, <laughs> it's, it's coming, be, baby. Christmas is coming early from Hot Hardware. So if you want to know about any of the stories we talked about today, you can check it out at hotharbor.com or you can go around the web. Is everybody ready for me to go around the web like I do every time we do this? Go around, Okay, IAS. let's try it this time. Facebook.com <laughs> slash hothardware, dig.com slash hothardware, twitter.com slash hothardware, and youtube.com slash hothardware vids for all your motion picture goodness from Hot Hardware. So there you go. I added an extra hot hardware because I wanted to see if I could say it without screwing it up. <laughs> there you go. You're, you're back in action, bro. Yeah, well, I get a little rusty in the middle there, and uh, but uh, I, think, I think we wrapped up well. Is there anything you guys would like to say to the folks at home? Maybe they're watching this instead of paying attention to their family on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Happy holidays. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, audience. And gobble, gobble. Yes.